Hey, it's me, Roosevelt, and we're in patch 4.5. There's a new book called Perry Perry Chicken. It has an ominous eye on the cover. It's about Conria. Yes, I did lose my mind, in fact. How did you know? So although this book is technically a tale based on a legend, and a hodgepodge of unverified hearsay over many generations, and truth could be interspersed with legend and fiction, this book may have had one of the legitimately biggest Conria lore drops to date, so I'm running with it Leroy Jenkins style. To start, Conria had at least two dynasties, the Crimson Moon and the Eclipse. The earlier Crimson Moon dynasty favored the Beastmaster Knights, who regularly used alchemy and rift wolves, also called dark sprites, as war beasts. The later Eclipse dynasty, which we're familiar with because of the Cataclysm, valued machinery over alchemy for their weaponry. These first two sections are going to be summary with some commentary, so you can skip those if you want to indulge yourself in more creative speculation. But the tale based on a legend starts with a practice of the Crimson Moon Dynasty. During the Crimson Moon Dynasty, lots of threats would slip into Conria, and their weaponry would wipe out any invading calamities. But what of the non-threats, like a child of a destroyed kingdom? So an advisor of the kingdom had a great idea. He relayed a story from another world to the ruler. The gods came from the ocean, so shipwrecked men were seen as those gods on clandestine missions to investigate the mortal realms. So they were rescued and treated as gods. We should totes do that too. The king was like, I don't get it, but that's cool, so sure. Of course, Conria as an underground realm didn't have oceans, but they did have a starry sky as a metaphorical ocean. So Conria built an orphanage to scoop up these shipwrecked sailors. But these sailors were actually anyone who happened to drift into Conria, presumably from the Starry Sea. Conria's hope was that these would be gods, or people who could transcend to godhood. So it kind of sounds like they may have already been looking for descenders all the way back then. This brings us to the titular character, Perrin Harry, who was one of these sailors who drifted in. Their first memory is going through some ritual in a dark corridor. The adults would ask, are you dead? And then, did you see it? During this trial, Perrin Harry would hallucinate seeing the blood red moon turn around to reveal a gigantic, horrified eyeball gazing at him. Perrin Harry emerged covered in soot, surviving the fires of two worlds. The story goes on to say the crimson moon set and the dark sun descended into a yet darker dusk. The orphanage would never catch the gods or transcendent ones they were looking for, but the orphanage would produce great warriors. For example, Perrin Harry would rise in those ranks. He was only matched, if not excelled by, his best friend Leobrant, but their friendship would change with the arrival of a third party. At some point, an alleged princess and divine envoy entered the realm, claiming to be from a land conquered by Deus Ari. Basically, Zhongli killed her master and she was left homeless. Upon arriving, she proclaims she will marry the strongest warrior. Leobrant was immediately infatuated. This princess, named Angelica in the book, would tell Leobrant about the outside world. On the other hand, Perrin Harry was suspicious of her identity and intention, as well as the effect she had on Leobrand. But at the same time, Perrin Harry was fascinated by her stories of the outside world as well. He was concerned for his friend, but was also infatuated in a different way. So Leobrand completely changed, instigating fights to prove his worth to her. Angelica's wishes would cause a great dilemma for Leobrand, as his actions could be deemed treacherous. But Leobrant, at the very least, did not want to betray his best friend, Perrin Harry. As for Perrin Harry, he believed he could only fix Leobrant by killing Angelica, who he saw as a wicked witch. It was a weird love triangle, friend triangle, and they were roommates triangle. Anyway, with tensions rising, the three would eventually leave the kingdom for unclear reasons. 
Upon setting foot outside the kingdom, Leobrant would clutch his face, the words from his mouth seeming more like the howl of the wild. What happens here when he leaves the kingdom is reminiscent of a note left behind by a Conran as the kingdom was falling. Those who fled to the surface were afflicted with a strange disease and turning into monsters. So it sounds like Leobrant was changing into a hilly churl as he left Conria. Given the timing of the legend, this tale supports the existence of hilly churls for thousands of years prior to the Cataclysm, like Ukko, presumably the priest of Salve and Dagnir. Angelica, cool as a cucumber, would explain that Leobrant was cursed, because he was a descendant of those who betrayed a god. That's also why Conria was a stickler for full bloods. Angelica goes on to explain she and Perenhari were not affected because neither ever betrayed a god. Angelica's god was killed, and Perenhari never had such an association to begin with as someone who drifted in. So, the root cause of the curse of the wilderness, then, seems to be an inherited betrayal of the gods. Perenhari battled all night, most likely against a transformed Leobrant. But eventually the sun would rise, and Perrin Harry would see Angelica's true form. Not a princess, not a wicked witch, but nothing. All he saw was an expanseless landscape. And that's the end of the tale, followed by technical notes and attributions. So, there's obviously a lot to unpack. But this book, I think, is ultimately about fate. And we'll get to that. I'd like to take a stab, first, at a closer look at the general history of Conria. We can surmise Conria was founded after the Second Who Came, around the same time of the destruction of Salve and Dagnir. But it's unclear when and why the dynasties changed. The only differentiation between the two dynasties we get is the shift from alchemy to machinery. We know Guizhong studied ruin machines prior to the Argon War. But Perrin Harry starts off during the Crimson Moon Dynasty, and Angelica claims to be from a nation conquered by Morax, perhaps during the Argon War, likely after Guizhong's death. So the timeline is a little wonky already, perhaps because time works differently in underground realms or the whole tale based on a legend thing. But it seems likely that alchemy and machinery coexisted throughout both dynasties, with the dynasties favoring one over the other. For example, Njord, a beastmaster of the Dark Sprites, and Alberic, the leader of Schwanenrisher, seem to have lived at the same time. Side note, I'm assuming that half the knights is Schwanenrisher, the pilots of the Ruin Golems, given their leader was an Alberic. And, Rhindaughter was still using Chemia at the end of the Eclipse Dynasty. Obviously. I think this shift, then, may have had to do with a switch in the power sources. Back in Sumeru, Jazari explains that although all Conrian ruin machines have a dark power source, the early ones had a backup system of energy blocks, called Azocyte, containing condensed leyline energy. This power system most likely had been in widespread use long before the first ruin machine was ever built in ancient Conria. But this energy system could not compete with a newly discovered perpetual energy source. And after the royal machine workshop Ganada was shut down, there was only the Schwanenritter workshop that had a complete azocyte-based system. So perhaps the Eclipse Dynasty actually signaled Conria's usage of dark powers as perpetual energy for their machinery. But more significantly, this was only possible because Conria started to look outward. They caught a glimpse of the edge of the universe and spied upon secrets from beyond the skies. Perhaps they were actively reaching out for, say, maybe a type of knowledge that has a specific flavor of forbidden. Also, solar eclipses have bright rings around them, and rings are shaped like passageways. Like a passageway to another realm or another world. Guys, what if the Eclipse Dynasty made a Stargate so they could get knowledge from aliens, bro? Okay, okay, I'm just joking about the Stargate, kind of. But the dark power shift was from peeking beyond the skies, so I still think that could be the Eclipse's deal. But I'm also inclined to think that there's more to this than just a shift in methodology. 
particularly because of a well-known line about Dainsliff. In Dainsliff's introduction, there is a line that reads, The eclipse was swallowed by the crimson moon. Now, there's just a lot in general going on with his introduction, but in retrospect, this seems to be referencing the dynasties. However, in the original Chinese, this would have been more literally translated to the Crimson Moon seeks vengeance on the Black Sun or the Eclipse. See, the Chinese provides an angle of intent and motivation. It implies that the Crimson Moon would have something to seek vengeance for. And as it turns out, as far as we can tell, there was a Crimson Moon during the Cataclysm. Now, aside from Perrin Harry's giant red moon eyeball hallucination, we've already seen a decent amount of red moon imagery, mostly connected to the Cataclysm. For example, in the We Will Be Reunited trailer, and also in the chaotic time space in the Chasm. And we also hear the red skies mentioned in many other sources, like from Clotar, in Aranyaka, and also A. But the Cataclysm isn't the only time it's mentioned. It's implied that the fall of Gurabad was also accompanied by a crimson moon, and the Faded Castle also suggests that the fall of Remuria was accompanied by a crimson moon as well. So this imagery all correlates with death and destruction. But it's more than just random death and destruction. What do Gurabad, Remuria, and Conria all have in common? Well, in Sumeru, Shirie's plague was seen as divine retribution, and Lilupar orchestrated the fall of Gurabad as punishment for their transgressions. In Ancient Fontaine, Remus wanted to defy fate, but escaping destined judgment was a mortal sin. Its people accepted the violence they inflicted on others, and thus were also violently destroyed. For Conria, well, whatever they did deemed them to be sinners. The destruction for all three was punishment, or judgment, for their actions. This means that the Blood Moon, then, is one of retribution and judgment. And it should be no surprise that an emblem of judgment would also be associated with death and destruction. For example, some versions of the Bible say, People are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. It also makes sense, then, why Perrin Harry saw a red moon during his death in the chimney. The crimson moon was the eye of judgment at death. Although for Perrin Harry, this was an odd case, but I'll get to that later. So this doesn't yet explain what exactly the Eclipse Dynasty did to incur the wrath of the crimson moon, or rather, the crimson eye of judgment. But I think the answer to this is not where you would expect to find it because we actually already have a Crimson Eye of Judgment in-game. We've had it for a very long time. It's something called the Auge de Verertelung. That's literally Eye of Condemnation in German. And it has everything to do with the Princessin de Verertelung, Fischl. As a side note and disclaimer, I'm talking about a book character named Fischl in-game, not playable Fischl but Playable Fischl basically crafted her lore based on these books, because she's like LARPing. Fischl, the Princessin der Verertelung, is a character from the Mr. Nine novels Legend of the Shattered Halberd and Flowers for Princess Fischl. In the latter, she's an outlander and traveler of worlds, and sovereign of the Immernachtreich, a world she created. She has a raven companion named Oz. Fischl also canonically has crimson eyes, as red as rubies. During a fated battle with the dragon Tusraku, the dragon scorched her heart, turning her eyes red. I've made quite a few videos talking about her if you want an in-depth look at her story, including one where I argue that she's basically a descender and the Shattered Halberd represents the Gnosis. There are actually quite a few reasons why I think the books are important, but the takeaway point is this. Fischl, the Princess of Condemnation, can see all fate in the world and renders judgment at the end of time. She's considered a world beast who at the end of the universe will swallow all dreams and grant benedictions to souls and cleanse the ugly and wicked. This is all possible due to her left eye, the Auge de Vertalung, 
or Eye of Condemnation. The Eye sees not only the threads of fate, but all that is true in the world. She claims to conceal her left eye for two reasons. It would not only be agonizing to see the truth of everything, but also disappointing to see through fantastic delusions. So you can basically say that the Aga de Vertelung is the eye of fate, truth, and judgment. These are three inherently intertwined concepts. So to summarize Fischl's role in her story, Every good, bright, and noble thing must eventually fall to inexorable entropic destruction, and the final destination of the universe is the realm in waiting of the Princessin, Immernachtreich. This is the fate of all worlds, of the universe, and all who live in it. So I hope I've illustrated the intrigue behind the Auge de Vertelung or Fischl's Crimson Red Eye of Judgment. Because I now want to pivot to an important plot point, and it's the story of how Fischl meets her companion Oz, because it's now more interesting than ever. Princess Fischl was traveling alone to the Kingdom of Eternal Twilight, the Dammerung, and encountered fate-resisting royals. They didn't acknowledge her stature and denied their royal lineage. They went as far as to basically attack her, she would be saved, though, by the Prince Knocked Robin, Oz. Oz would actually destroy the Damarung, as the Damarung, or the Twilight, is the nemesis of the Noctvarung, or the Night. So, the fate-resisting royals of the Kingdom of Eternal Twilight forsook Princess Fischl, the Sovereign of the Evernight Kingdom and the Bearer of the Crimson Eye of Judgment, and turned against her. Oz rescued Fischl, rendering judgment on the kingdom by destroying it. Methinks this may be an allegory. Based on the discussion that the switch between alchemy and machinery was really about a switch in the power source, we can infer that the real difference between the dynasties was looking for otherworldly knowledge and power. Consider the letter addressed to the Schwanenritter captain, to petition the king to preserve the old machinery. It acknowledges that the four pillars of the kingdom achieved prosperity through spying upon secrets beyond the sky. However, the old Azocyte system should be preserved because this perpetual dark energy is not perfect either. This is also reflected in the Mocking Mask, where Piero urged against the unveiling of sin, which ushered in the eventual retribution. Fischl's story may be getting at what this unveiling of sin truly was. Compare the Evernight and Twilight Kingdoms with the Crimson Moon and Eclipse Dynasties, respectively, and pay particularly close attention to the key phrase, Fate Resisting Royals. Fischl explicitly says that sin defies fate's rightful decree. So, defying fate is the ultimate sin. This makes sense, then, if the Crimson Moon represents the Eye of Fate, Truth, and Judgment. Perhaps the Crimson Moon Dynasty, like the Evernight Kingdom, submitted to fate. But the Eclipse Dynasty would not yield, and thus, the Eclipse turned to otherworldly means to defy fate. Okay, pause. But this may feel contradictory given Conria was a godless nation outside the realm of Tevat especially if you equate the heavenly principles to fate itself. But also, the sustainer cubes do have crimson eye symbols on them, so... There are a lot of things we don't know, and the crimson moon may be entirely different from the Conria we actually think we know. And, perhaps being human simply means being subject to the rules of fate. But regardless, the existence of the Orphanage also suggests they wanted a descender for a reason. And Perrin Harry's death and rebirth, aka the Chimney Trial, may be revealing something about that. It's very weird that Perrin Harry's first memory is being directed to crawl through a small, sealed, dark corridor filled with coal ash, right? One seemingly designed for children? and then was asked if he was dead, and then was asked if he saw something weird. The adults embraced him, saying he survived the fire of two worlds and was thus reborn. Like, that's a weird first memory, right? 
Well, knowing that the Crimson Moon Dynasty regularly used alchemy, combined with the specific imagery of soot and ash and death and purifying flames, it may actually make more sense than you might think. This hearth full of soot reminds me of the first stage of Negredo in alchemy. Negredo is literally a stage of death. In alchemy, a decayed black starter material is subjected to a purgatorial fire, which purifies it into white ash. The transition from Negredo to Albedo, or from the blackness to whiteness, is typically seen as resurrection or rebirth. So there is a lot of truth, then, to Perrin Harry answering that he was, in fact, dead. And Perrin Harry surviving the fire and his rebirth may be referencing the purging flames from Negredo to Albedo. This is to say, then, the orphanage, at least at first, wasn't literally taking in children from another world. Instead, they were perhaps taking the primordial forms from the Starry Seas and creating life alchemically. Because remember, the Orphanage originally took in beings who could transcend the gods. It wasn't until the later days that they took in the kingdom's orphans or children who wandered in from the outside. I recently made a video on Conry and alchemy, so give that a watch if you want more of a deep dive. In that same video, I explored the idea that Rhyndotter ultimately wanted to create a descender as the Philosopher's Stone through alchemy. So perhaps there may be a theoretical pipeline of originating from the Starry Seas or the Abyss and becoming a Descender. And the Orphanage of Conria was doing an early version of what Rhyndotter is doing now. Of course, the fact Conria never found that transcendent one indicates that the alchemy of this hearth was never fully complete. But that's just the beginning of Perrin Harry's story. His encounter with Angelica, I think, interrogates the true nature of the Crimson Moon Dynasty. Angelica's claims for her origins, I feel, are dubious at best. Leobrant was madly in love with her and Perrin Harry wanted her dead. But at the same time, Perrin Harry was intrigued by her as well. Both Leobrant and Perrin Harry were infatuated by her in different ways. The end of the tale implies that they both wanted what she represented to them. I am freedom, that which has broken free of fate. She was not a princess nor witch. She was something more abstract. Her final words to Perrin Harry, This is what Leobrant sought in agony, but that which is now yours for the taking. This, to me, implies that despite not having a curse, Perrin Harry did have what some might consider a curse, being bound to fate. Because at the end of the tale, which, if you treat as more of an allegory, he has escaped fate. To me, this fits thematically with one of the very first lines of the book. It is said that in those days of the Crimson Moon Dynasty, birds had not yet split into domestic and wild kindreds. You could see this as talking about those bound by fate and those free from fate. Perhaps Perrin Harry's ending with him finding freedom represents the split with him becoming a wild bird. This has very important implications. It implies that the first undifferentiated birds had no concept of freedom, completely bound by fate. This would also line up with the Crimson Moon Dynasty submitting to fate, but let me put it this way. You may not follow the gods, but how could you truly yearn to break the shackles of fate if the concept of freedom didn't even exist? It only existed as a feeling in the desire and ambition of Perrin Harry. So the book starts off with one type of bird and ends up with a new type of wild bird. And between these two, Perrin Harry had a vision of the Auge de Fertilung, or what I consider the eye of fate, truth, and judgment. And it was horrified. Horrified, perhaps, because it foresaw the desire of breaking those shackles. There's one last thing about this Crimson Moon or Aga de Vertalung I need to talk about, because there are a few characters who share striking similarities to Fischl. And 
there, there's there's been a bit of speculation so far since my summary, but I, I wanted to uh, give a disclaimer that we're going to get really creative. So we're going to have fun. So King Earman seems to be a reference to Odin, the Allfather of the North's Pantheon, mostly because of their names and they both have one eye, and because the Silver Twig references a famous Odin myth with a king who found an underground nation after hanging from the world tree and gaining hella knowledge. I've drawn a lot of comparisons as well between Odin and Fischl. They both have raven companions who let them spy on the entire world, and they also have the gift of Seder. Seder is the magical art of foresight and prophecy, or, you know, seeing fate. So, you can draw a lot of parallels between Irmin and Fischl then, down to the fact that the Deathly Statuette, seemingly representing Irmin, has a single ruby eye. And this isn't even considering their connection in the Mr. Nine books, with Irmin and Fischl as the first and last divine halberds. But I've previously used this odin Irmin fischl connection to suggest that Irmin himself also has the gift of Seder, or in other words, the Uge de Vertelung. As a side note, I originally made this connection to suggest that King Irmin and the Sinner were linked, because the Sinner can also see fate and resides at fate's end. Also, fun fact, as Fischl travels space and time, with every world and every countless story and tragic fate she sees, she sheds a tear, similar to how the Sinner will shed a tear at the end of time. Kinda like how the eye on the cover of Perrin Harry is also crying. I don't actually have any real thoughts about the Sinner, I just, uh, I just miss him, okay? I digress, but let's go back to this idea that Irmin also has the Aga de Vertelung. This would imply that he would be associated with the Crimson Moon dynasty, because he'd be the Crimson Moon himself. Which may seem contradictory, because he's mentioned in the note to petition for saving the old machinery, and he was the last king before the Cataclysm, although you can be first and last, and the Alberics perhaps ran a very, very short regent dynasty. But you know what, this is the fun section, and it may be vibes only, but f it, I'm running with it. King Irmin had the Auge de Vertelung. He was the Crimson Moon. Simply because I think it'd be super f***ing funny if King Irmin were just a giant eyeball. He's the one-eyed king, literally. <laughs> Listen, I already have an insane list of things I think about King Irmin, so this should surprise no one. He's everything because he's my everything. Okay, now that I have that out of my system, there's something else I want to talk about, because there's yet another character who seems to have a lot of ties to Fischl, Irmin, Conria, and the Crimson Moon. Someone everyone is excited to see more of. Someone mysterious, someone with strange eyes, four-pointed cross-star imagery, and a connection to orphans. Yes, I'm talking about Kaya. Of course it's Kaya! Of course! Did you really think I would let you out of the basement without me talking about Kaya in a video about Conria? Hey, and listen, he has a double orphan connection because he lost two fathers. Okay, and real talk, I think, no doubt, this book is somehow foreshadowing Arlecchino in some way, but other people have been making a lot of videos, so I'll let them cover that. But for now, it's Kaya time. First off, in the Hidden Strife note, Kaya mentions his father with quotation marks. It's a strange way to write it, especially seeing Linny and Lynette and Fremine refer to Arlecchino the same way. Arlecchino, of course, runs the House of the Hearth. Now, knowing that Conria placed great significance on this orphanage of theirs, I wonder, could he have actually come from this orphanage? Ignoring the wonky timeline, because time is an illusion anyway. But if this is where he really came from, maybe this is why Kaya isn't cursed, just like Perrin Harry. Secondly, Fischl and Kaya both compare themselves to each other. Kaya jokes that maybe he's also a prince, just like Fischl. And this isn't the first time Kaya jokes about being an actual prince either. He teases us a lot about it in his hangout. Now, this could just be a reference to the Alberics being regents. But it's always kind of been odd to me that the Hidden Strife note makes such a point to say that the Alberics were not of royal blood. It makes me wonder if they actually forsook their nobility, 
like if they denied their 13,000 year lineage as a branch of the royal family. You know, like fate resisting royals with a fortune mocking pedigree. Fischl, on the other hand, remarks that Kaya's fate is vexing, and she wonders if Kaya also has mystical sight. Here, Fischl specifically means the Uge de Vertelung, the eye that can see all fate, the eye that can see all truth. Which is weird when you think about it, because every time we meet Kaya, he's like, wow, I didn't expect to see you, fate sure is crazy. And in his story quest, which is like the second one you can do like super early in the game, he mentions an abyss dragon, an eight-headed hydra, and a silver-haired banshee, which all seem to be references to Devalin, Osile, and Senora. And I also personally think in his story about his grandpa's sword, he was referencing a holy blade that would defeat these three, meaning he knew from the get-go that you were a descender. So let's put all of this in a blender and see what comes out. So maybe Kaya somehow has an alchemical origin himself. And maybe the Alberix also actually had royal blood. And somehow, Kaya ended up with the Aget de Veretalung of Irvin himself. So there's only one thing this can really mean. Kaya is a vessel for King Irmin and has the Aga de Veretalung. I will literally bet you every single viewer right now, $10, $20 if you subscribe, that his eye patch eye is red. I've done it, folks. My insane list of Irmin theories has met my insane list of Kaya theories. We have converged. We have reached the singularity. It's turtles all the way down, except instead of turtles, it's just Kaya. Yes, girl, you are on to nothing. Cook <laughs> somewhere else.